Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another session of OLC 40 Term 1B. Today is November 22nd. We are on class number six. We are still on unit one. We're working through lesson two, and today's lesson is going to cover assignments seven through nine. Yesterday, we talked about six, a little bit of seven, and we didn't get really f that much further. So today, we're going to talk about seven, eight, and nine, and that's going to finish off lesson two and I'm hoping that tomorrow's class we can jump into lesson three. So we are in uh, week number two of a nine-week course. For those of you who are taking this class through an independent learning model, these uh, these dates don't really matter to you but they do sort of tell you how how long it takes someone to go through this course um, if you're doing it in a, in a registered term. So it should take you about nine weeks to go through the material. And if you're doing it independent learning, then you have more time. But it's, it's important to stay on task. And our last day of classes will be January 26th. That's going to be the, um, that'll be my last broadcast for this class. Maybe next week or sometime this week I can put up the class schedule and we can sort of see where we are. But the first three weeks of the class we typically stay within Unit 1, maybe going to Unit 2. And if we have time at the end, then I'll give you lots of prep for your exam and give you lots of tips and things like that to get you ready. So we do broadcast live every Monday to Thursday from 10 to 10.55 Central Standard Time. And all of the ways that you can join that broadcast are on your screen right now. Look for me on YouTube. I'm, I'm starting to see a lot of views on the YouTube video, so that's great. So I can see that students are watching them. You know, and uh, leave a comment if you want, or send me an email if you want me to talk about something different, or... Any kind of feedback I can receive on these lessons would be would be amazing. And I've had a few conversations with students who were watching the videos, and, and they did they did give me some feedback already, and I really appreciate that. And I've already used it to hopefully make these lessons even better. So just plug in that search right here. Search for Laverty Wassa, you will find me. So you need to start submitting that work. There's lots of ways you can do that. Now's a good time to mention the Adobe Scan. That's an app you can get on your phone. That's Google, Apple. It's on both. It's free. Highly recommend that Google Scan app. It cleans up your photographs. It cleans up um, any kind of document that you scan with it. It's designed for that. It's meant for scanning documents that have words on it. The app recognizes when maybe your hands are not quite steady, maybe you're taking it on an angle, it straightens things out, it cleans it up, and then it turns it into a PDF. So very handy. There are many ways you can reach me. So obviously, you know, Facebook Messenger, it's, you know, 24-7. You can do that anytime you want. Same with email. If you want to phone me, the numbers are listed there. And these are the times you want to phone my extension. And you want to enter this extension, or if you get the receptionist, just ask for Mike. There's only one of me. And this is where you should be at this point. You should have read up to the first 34 pages-ish, you know, maybe 30 to 40 pages of Unit 1. That's what covers the assignments one through nine, and you should have completed assignments one through five and started to at least think about six, seven, eight, and nine. But we're talking about them in class now, so if you haven't started them, that's, that's fine. Most people will want to get a review on the lesson, and, and I recommend you do that. I, I trust that you can go and read the material on your own but the whole point of these classes is to give you a framework and hopefully give you some tips and strategies for approaching the questions. 
So let's jump into today's lessons. We will do our words of the day. We'll look at a headline. Today's punctuation will be the semicolon. Sometimes you see it with the hyphen in there. Sometimes like this. Yesterday we did colons. Today we're doing the semicolon. Semi means part or half, right? Our part of speech today will be the adverb. And we will look at assignments 7, 8, and 9 of assignment, sorry, lesson 2. Here's our learning goals for today. We are going to learn the nine parts of speech. We're going to learn the definition of an adverb. We are going to review the proper use of a semicolon. And just like yesterday, we're going to learn about the rap rock method for answering questions about a text. The rap rock method is very useful for answering questions that ask you to look at a text and to draw material from the text, make your own assumptions or inferences about the text, and to make connections with the text to your own life, to other things you've read, other things you've watched, listened to, enjoyed, etc. The rap rock method is also great for answering journal entries. And we'll, and we'll discuss that at the end of today's lesson. So we will know we've been successful today if we can understand the definition, not a pronoun, of an adverb. Sorry, this is yesterday's. And we're going to learn how to use a semicolon properly. And hopefully, you will use the rap rock method to complete at least one assignment from lesson two. And if you can do these three things, you will be, this will be a successful lesson for you and I. If I can teach you these three things and you can understand them, then we're all winning. So we've almost done all the seven grandfather teachings. We've done love, respect, bravery, honesty, wisdom, and we will do humility today. And we've got, uh, yeah, today's one, one, two, three, four, five, class number six. So tomorrow will be truth, and that will be the end of the, we will have done all seven grandfather teachings for our word of the day. And then we'll be on to a different category. So we have the word humility in English. And we have Dibi, Dibi Den Dizawin in uh, Anishinaabemowin or Ojibwe, when that's humility, is to know yourself as a sacred part of creation. So at its core, humility is to know that you're part of something bigger than you. That there, there are things greater than yourself, that you're part of something great and it doesn't mean that you think less of yourself, but it just, it just, being humble just means the acknowledgement that you're part of something bigger. So on, on a deeper level, we can think about this concept as to think lower of oneself in relation to all that sustains us, commonly referred to as humility. And we see the word is broken up into four components. Dabas, which is lower, lower and pertaining to thought, is he, state or condition, and of course that win suffix again, the way it is done. It's represented by the wolf, and the wolf lives for his pack, and the ultimate shame is to be an outcast. So it's when you're a member of a team, when you're a member of a pack, you, you need humility. Even if you're the leader of that pack, you still need to be humble and realize that you rely upon other people, other animals, other other forces to, to get by in your life. You know, you're not you can't do things by yourself. So that's that's humility. So I always like to break down these words and look at the dictionary definition and maybe challenge that definition a little bit. So humility is a noun, it's a thing. It's the quality or condition of being humble, modest opinion or estimate of one's own importance, rank, etc. 
and then related to that word, we've got the hum at the start, right? We've got humble. Humble is an adjective. It means not proud or arrogant, modest, having a feeling of insignificance, inferiority, subservience, etc. Low in rank, important, status, quality, etc. Courteously respectful. So different kinds of meanings, right? So some of these have a, a negative connotation to them, right? So when we say that a denotation is, um, this is what a word, you know, literally means. That's its definition, right? That's its, its denotation. And then a connotation is, you know, these are like other meanings. Some words in the English language have only one very specific meanings. Some words in the language have several meanings, and it depends on how they're used in a sentence, right? So, so the denotation is what a word literally means, that you know, it can't be argued, and the connotation is the other meanings, and you know, typically, you know, like the, the denotation is not really arguable. Everybody agrees on that. The connotation is the part that we can argue and the part that um, could be different depending on your opinion of it, right? So, so looking at that word, and it's, it's really important to look at roots, look at the history of a word. So humus is a Latin phrase that means ground, and humilis is a Latin word for low or lowly. And from that, we get the word hummus or humus, which is a noun. Now, hummus is two things. One thing, it's partially decomposed organic matter, the organic component of soil. So remember, you know, um, humble means low or to the ground, literally. And hummus is actually earth. It's like the part that sustains life. Hummus is also an Arabic word. So I'm not, if maybe you've been to the grocery store or had Arabic food from the Middle East, it's a thick spread made from chickpeas, tahini, lemon juice and garlic and hummus literally means chickpea in Arabic and you see in Arabic it's got the two M's right uh, whereas this word's only got the one so and that's and that's kind of an interesting concept when you think about it right so to be humble is to realize that you're from the earth right and you know from ashes to ashes from dust to dust you will you will go back to the earth right so you, you belong to the earth, you came from the earth, you will go back to it at some point, right? So that's, that's being humble, low to the ground. And it doesn't mean that you think lowly of yourself. It doesn't mean you have to have a low self-opinion or low self-esteem. It just means that you're grounded, quite literally, that you, you, you don't think that you're better than others and you don't think that you're more important than the world or other people. It means that you're a part of it. You are the world. Or at least, you know, that's my opinion of it. You may have a different interpretation than me, but that's, that is our word of the day. Here's some quotes I pulled off the internet, which I thought were kind of funny. So we've got Dwayne The Rock Johnson says, I'm always asked, what's the secret to success? But there are no secrets. Be humble, be hungry, and always be the hardest worker in the room. Muhammad Ali, it's hard to be humble when you're as great as I am which is like a joke. It's very funny. He, he, he was always telling jokes, but that's great, right? So you can't be humble when you're as great as I am. Um, Kanye West, people always tell you, be humble, be humble. When was the last time someone told you to be amazing? Be great, be awesome. So I, I, I do like that quote. I, I do love Dwayne The Rock Johnson's quote and Kanye West. They're very different, right, in terms of their approach, right? So, But I think you can take truth from both of them, right? I think there's some times when you really do need to believe in yourself and tell yourself you need to be awesome and do great things. But there's times in your life where you got to be humble and you got to be hungry and you got to just work hard. So that's how people have used that quote. 
All right, on to our punctuation of the day. The semicolon, right? So the colon is the dot and the dot and the semi or part, part colon or half colon. It only has one dot and it has the little apostrophe at the end of it, right? So it, it's, it's, it's half, of a, half of a colon. And as we'll see, they do have similar functions. So semicolons help us connect closely related ideas. That's its primary function. That's what it primarily does. It helps us connect closely related ideas. They're also used to separate items in a list when the items in the list have commas. And I'll explain that in a second. So they're most often used to connect independent, independent clauses. And I've said this before, and I'll say it again. A clause is the building block of a sentence. And an independent clause is one that can stand on its own. It's got a subject. It's got a predicate. So remember, the subject is what the sentence is about. It's the main thing. The predicate is what is said about that, that thing. And they make sense on their own. So they could stand on their own. However, the writer may choose to connect them if they are related. And we'll see how that plays out. So here's one sentence. I grew up in a house full of music. Complete sentence. Independent clause. My father and mother were constantly playing their favorite albums. Another independent clause, right? So independent clause plus independent clause equals a new sentence. I grew up in a house full of music. Semicolon. So the semicolon is the glue. It's the, uh, it's the screw that joins these two sentences together. And now they become one big sentence. I grew up in a house full of music. My father and mother were constantly playing their favorite records. So you can see how these two ideas are very closely related. I'm growing up in a house full of music, and here's an explanation of how that played out, right? I had two parents, and they were always playing their favorite albums, their favorite music. The semicolon can also connect two independent clauses using a conjunction, and a conjunction is a joining word, and a comma. So we have to use them both. So, it's, so in this case, growing up, my dream was to play in the NHL. Independent clause. This, this sentence could be on its own, and it is on its own right here. Another independent clause. I lack the discipline and the raw talent to play at an elite level. So independent clause plus independent clause equals brand new sentence. Growing up, my dream was to play in the NHL, semicolon. However, comma, so you get the conjunction followed by a comma. However, comma, I lack the discipline and raw talent to play at an elite level. So I could scrap the word however and just say I, I lack the discipline, but the word however is a useful word in this sense. It's like, well, this is true, this is also true, right? So, or while this might have happened, this was also happening, right? So I had the desire to do this thing. I wanted to be an NHL star, but... So we, we could use the word but here as well, right? It, it would function the same way. But and however, they, they function the same way in the language. Um, however is a little more formal. But it's, as a writer, you would choose which one you want to use. If I use the word and, that would work as well. But I think the word however is the, is the stronger choice here. And it conveys the meaning of what I want to say. If I said the word so, it would change the meaning a lot. Because if, I, if you use the word so, so basically means because. Right? So growing up, my dream was to play in the NHL because I lacked the discipline. It wouldn't make sense. They're not related that way. It's like both of these things exist independently of each other, but 
my lack of discipline and talent had a, had a big impact on my dream, right? Like a lot of people, right? So, and then we can also separate items in a list when the items contain commas. So, remember yesterday we, we talked about how a colon can set up a list. So when the colon sets up that list, but the individual items in that list have commas, it gets really confusing because you have a whole bunch of commas and you don't know what the individual items are. So in my example, I used to work at a Quiznos when I lived in Winnipeg, and these are some of my favorite sandwich combinations, right? So the turkey, bacon, and guac... That's one sandwich, but it's turkey, comma, bacon, comma, right? And so I use that. Um, so, so that whole sandwich is one sandwich. And then I use the semicolon right here to, to block that one off and then go on to the next one. The next sandwich you might want to get is the chicken, bacon, and ranch, right? Semicolon. The next sandwich you might want to order is the ham, Swiss, and honey barbecue sauce. And finally, the new sandwich place has a third option, meatballs, hot sauce, and mozzarella, right? So there's four sandwich options. Each one has three key ingredients. We use the semicolon to block off, to block off those items in the list. So when I'm a reader and I'm reading this sentence, I know that, okay, I can get a chicken bacon ranch or I can get a ham, Swiss, and honey barbecue. Otherwise, the whole thing would just run together. And you'd have a turkey, bacon, guac, chicken, bacon, ranch, ham, Swiss, you know, a big Frankenstein sandwich, right? Which might be good, it might not be, but as a writer, I'm trying to convey to you that there's four sandwiches. You've got four sandwiches and then they each have three toppings. So I'm trying to give you my list, and that's how the semicolon functions there. Okay, on to today's headline. So we have a headline from the Globe and Mail, and the headline reads, Indigenous Objects Repatriated from Small British Museum Come Home to Haida Gwaii. The objects arrived on Haida Gwaii in late August from Britain, among them a heavy, intricate, argillite carving of a ceremonial feast platter depicting a rockfish and orcas and inlaid with bone, likely made in the 19th century. So that's our headline and that's our description. Let's look at that headline and break it down. I've color-coded all of the parts of speech, as I usually do. Nouns are in blue, verbs in green, prepositions in red, adjectives in orange, adverbs in purple. So in this case, we, we've broken down in, so th th there's actually two ways of looking at this. So indigenous objects, it's a thing that we're talking about in this article. So you could, you could argue that objects is a noun and indigenous is an adjective that describes that noun. So th there's two ways to look at that. So that we could either call that a noun phrase or we could say that indigenous is an adjective that is modifying the word object. Both of them are correct. It would, it, it's kind of like a, a matter of interpretation, but I've, I've chosen to say that indigenous objects is a noun phrase. All right, so the objects were repatriated. That's what happened to them. Usually when we talk about something being repatriated, it's used to talk, it's usually used to talk about a person. So if a, if a person is taken away from their home country or their home community, and then they return to that community, sort of like uh, Jimmy, and Jimmy comes home, he's being repatriated. So when, you, when you're repatriated, you, you come back. And it, it's, got a, it's patriotic, is, 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 is a love of your homeland. So it's that same root. So when you're repatriated, you come back. 
from is a relationship word, so they're coming from a small British museum. So we've got a thing, a noun phrase, a British museum. It's not a big British museum, it's a small one. So the adjective small is modifying this noun phrase. They come, that's a verb, home, ad, this adverb is modifying this verb, so we'll talk about that in a sec. It's going to Haida Gwaii, and Haida Gwaii is, of course, a proper noun. They're not coming from Haida Gwaii, they're going to. So prepositions are relationship words. They tell us where something is, where it's going, uh, when it's going there, when it went there. So where and when are the two big components of the preposition. So today we're talking about adverbs. So an adverb modifies or qualifies an adjective, a verb, or other ad, or I should say or an other, or other adverbs. I'm correcting my own grammar as we go along here. Right? So that's what they can do, right? So they, they, can, they can modify or qualify. And when you modify something, you change it. You change its meaning. You give it additional information. And to qualify something is kind of the same idea, but it, it tells you, like, specific information about something. They most commonly tell us how an action was done. So that is the most common function of an adverb. It's the one you're going to encounter the most in the English language. The adverb tells us how something was done. Remember, it. one way to remember this is it adds, it adds to a verb. We have a verb, and the adverb is adding to it. It's giving us more information. So that's the whole point of language. The whole point of language is to convey information. We're trying to give information. We're trying to give information to our friends, to our family, to the world, to whoever our audience is, right? We're trying to give them information. And the parts of speech are the tools that we have to do that. An adverb can also modify an entire sentence or parts of a sentence, right? So the adverb is a very useful term or part of speech. So we've got to use how, learn how to use it properly. Here's four ways we can use an adverb. So my motor is running well this summer. So if we're talking about my boat motor, it's, um, if I told you my motor is running this summer, you would know that I've got a motor and you would know that it's running. But it's running well. Right? So it's running well. The word well is the adverb here, right? It tells you how. It tells you how my motor is running. Okay? Second example modifies another adverb. The race finished too quickly. So if I told you the race finished quickly, you would know that there was a race and it finished quickly. Sure. The word too in this sense, they're both adverbs, right? Um, both of these words are adverbs, right? I could say the race finished, and then you would know that it finished. Okay. It finished quickly. Okay, that's more information. It finished too quickly. If something finishes too quickly, it's like there's a problem, right? The fact that it finished so quick must have been a problem for somebody. Adverbs modify an adjective. So the house is quite cold this morning. So if I told you my house is cold, the word cold is an adjective, and the adverb quite modifies that adjective. It gives you additional information. It qualifies it, right? So if I told you my house is cold, you'd be like, okay, the house is cold. But if I say it's quite cold or very cold, you would have a different meaning in your mind. Adverb modifying a group of words. Fortunately, we recorded a video of the moose. So I could just simply tell you, I took a video of a moose, and you're like, okay. But if I said fortunately, that word fortunately is modifying everything we see right here. It's telling me it was fortunate or lucky. And that, so that, that changes the meaning of, of the sentence. All right, so hopefully we've 
we've got that down and we understand that part of speech. So I'm just going to briefly recap from yesterday. So there are different ways we can look at a text and draw information from it. So when we read a text, and, and then remember a text can be a short story, a poem, a magazine article, a tweet, um, an email, a birthday card, a novel, an encyclopedia. A text is anything that's got a bunch of words in it, and you read it, and you draw meaning from it. So directly stated information is words that are in the text. They're the words that the writer said. You and I cannot argue about that. You know, if I say flip to page seven and read the first paragraph, there's no debate. There's no opinion. It's just there. That's directly stated. It's in the text. We can't argue about it, but we can use it to make arguments. All right. So that's where you make an opinion and that's when you're trying to ex and express a thought about something. And that's where you and I can disagree. You can say, on page 7, Jimmy says this. Because he says this, he actually means this. Now, that's your opinion. And I can either agree with you, disagree, offer a different take on it. But we can't disagree on what's in the text. The text is the text. And the directly stated information so if a question is saying you know find an example list this locate that identify that tell me about this or tell the difference between this it's telling us to look for specific stuff now of course indirectly is the opposite right and in this case they're not like direct opposites but they are different in the sense that the direct information is in the text the indirect is the stuff the author is not saying. Yesterday I used the example of a joke. Jokes often become unfunny when someone explains it to you. And part of the fun and you know and and I think reading should be fun. It should it should be something you enjoy and you may be forced to read something for an assignment or whatever the case may be. But part of the joy and like the 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 the, the reason why we read stuff is so we can figure it out on ourselves. Reading like like short stories and novels and literature, they're sort of like puzzles. And 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 part of the fun is is to figure it out on your own. So the author is going to leave a lot of things unstated, right? They're going to set up scenes and they're not going to tell you everything. You have to read it and figure things out on your own. And when you're figuring things on your own, you are reading between the lines, right? That's a metaphor we use for that. So what is the author saying by not saying it, right? And that's actually, you know, there's a very popular meme you might find on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, where it's like, you know, tell me you're doing this without tell me you're doing this. So there's many ways that we give people information without actually giving it to them, right? People can just look at us. And they can read our body language. They can see what kind of clothes we wear. They can see how we talk to other people. And they can get a lot of information out of you, even if you're not even talking, right? So same, same goes for a book. And so indirect information is asking you to predict things and to use clues to come up with this. And so based on what you know about this, you know, think about this. Um, so... So, so take what you know and then expand on it and, and fill in the blanks, right? So this is actually, you know, one, one, of, one of the things I love a lot, one of the things I love reading about is archaeology and um, anthropology and just how people can look at like a bone or a tool and go back a million years, go back 10,000 years, 30,000 years, and try to make predictions about what humans would have been like back then, they have to go with a very small amount of direct information, and they have to make predictions and use a couple of clues to build up a bigger theory, right? So they don't have a lot of evidence to go on. 
sort of like forensic science, right? You go into a crime scene, you don't have a video of what happened. All you have is a little piece over here, a little piece over there, and you take those pieces and you try to make connections between them and try to build a bigger theory. That's indirect information. And then we're making connections, right, which is similar. So instead of, you know, instead of taking the text and reading between the lines, we're, we're sort of like combining the two. We're taking what's in the text, we're reading between the lines, and then we're making connections with our own lives. So you're taking what's in the text and you're making connections between, it, it's, it's you, it's other things you read, it's, um, it's movies, it's books, it's art. So, and, and when you see a question that has the word you in it, that's your big tip off, right? So what do you think? Uh, what would you do? What's your opinion? You're, asked, you're being asked to bring yourself to the text, right? And that's why writers write. They might write to make money and be famous, and that's true. But I think people, and story, storytellers of all kinds, right? People love to tell a story because they, they like to be the center of attention and they want to share their story. But I think, you know, most storytellers, they want to reach other people. And they, and they want to have an impact on them. And the best storytellers are the ones that make their audience think about their own lives and to connect what the writer is saying with their life, right? So, so yesterday we talked briefly about how to incorporate a text, uh, how, how to incorporate a quote from a text into our writing. So you can go back and review that. Just for the sake of time, I'm going to jump up ahead here. So really important, I want to stress this again. Assignment number six is going to ask you what kind of information is being asked for. You have to identify that in your response to me. Tell me, is, this, is, is assignment six part one, is it direct information, indirect information, or is it asking me to make connections? Do that for number two. Number three, you don't have to. But number three, you do have to give me your thoughts in full sentences, right? Always, whenever possible, your default mode should be a full sentence. This is a writing course. Sometimes it might be appropriate for you to use uh, bullet points in point form, but most of the time I want to see full sentences. We talked about this in class number five, so you can go back and review that if you need more information. So we're going to delve into the rap rock method. So rap rock is, of course, an acronym. Acro. Whoops. It's an acronym, a word where every letter in the in the word stands for something. Restate, answer, prove, relate, opinion, conclude. So for assignment seven, there's a series of questions. So where did Jimmy spend the last 18 months of his life and why? And you might want to use that rap rock method, right? So restate the question. So where did Jimmy spend the last 18 months of his life? Jimmy spent the last 18 months of his life in blank. He was there because of, you know, prove it. Show me where it is in the text and quote the text if you can. Question two, how does Jimmy feel about going home? Use clues from the text to answer this. So you can't answer this question unless you use a lot of proof, right? So use a lot of quotes from the text, but try to incorporate them in your own writing or try to set them up like, you know, uh, Jimmy, um, you know, Jimmy is angry when he comes back, right? So how does he feel, right? So if the question is about feel, we're looking for emotions, right? Emotions and I would say actions, right? Because how you feel is going to determine how you act, right? But what emotions does Jimmy feel? Is he sad? Is he angry? Is he aggressive? Is he... Is he depressed? Is he tired? Is he energetic? Is he feisty? Is he, uh, is he confused? You know, how does he feel about being home? Is he conflicted? Is he 
Does he know what he has to do? Is he focused? Is he is he unfocused? Is he is he angry at the world? Is he is he ready to forgive? How how is Jimmy feeling? Right? Give me some emotions. And tell me what he's doing. Use clues from the text to answer that. Give your opinion of Jimmy, the situation he's in, any interesting comments you may like to share with your friend. So if, if you read the, the prompt on this assignment, you have to imagine like you've got a friend and the friend isn't reading Jimmy Comes Home, but you want them to read Jimmy Comes Home. So you got to like tell me about Jimmy and, and try to make Jimmy be, seem interesting. And so... The novel is Jimmy Comes Home. Jimmy is, of course, the main character. So if you don't like Jimmy, you're not going to like this book. Or you're not going to even pick it up in the first place. So you've got to sell this book. You've got to tell me why Jimmy is interesting. Why should I care about Jimmy? You know, that, that's what you're doing here, right? So give your opinion of Jimmy. There is no wrong answer. Um, well, I, I sh I'll take that back. It, if you don't make Jimmy's life seem interesting, that's a wrong answer, right? So just make Jimmy, tell me why Jimmy matters, in your opinion. Assignment 7, Part 4 says, As you were reading the text, was there a point where you paused to think about something in your own life or something that you have read or watched before? You have to use two of the during reading make connections prompts to explain using full sentences. So there's uh, five of them right there. I already know about. This text reminds me of. This compares to. This text is different from because this section made me think about, you know, and the word section, you could just change that to chapter, same thing. This chapter or passage, you know, a chapter is a full chapter of a, of a book. A passage is like several paragraphs or a longer chunk of writing from a text. So you got to pick two of these and write and then write a full sentence. And your full sentence will start with that prompt. So you'll use this text, dot, 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 you know, your own ideas. Writing prompts are very useful, right? They sort of, they give you a jumping off point. So you're going to pick two of these as your jumping off point, okay? Assignment 7, Part 5 asks you to sketch the main ideas in this chapter into a four-panel comic book strip. You don't have to be a great artist but you just got to give me four strips and you know at the at the end of this we'll see my awesome drawing abilities here you've got Jimmy's uh that's Jimmy's sled right he's got the he's got the track on it this is Jimmy's uh snow machine over here and this is Jimmy and he's kind of uh He's hugging. That's Jimmy right there. <laughs> yeah, so that's Jimmy. He's hugging his snow machine. Um, he's happy, right? Maybe he's got a backwards hat. I don't know. He's got a backwards hat. And yeah, he's, he, he really likes that snow machine, right? That makes him happy. And we've got, you know, the... Uh, Jimmy Jimmy came home on a plane, right? So this is the plane. This is the airport with the airport uh, control tower. It looks kind of like a radio antenna. So that's, you know, there's the tarmac. So Jimmy's coming home. Um, and then these are all the little children uh, talking to Jimmy. And that's Big Jimmy right here. And we've got the house that uh, he lives in, right? And there's the door to the house. <laughs> that's rough, right? I mean, you, you can make that a lot better. But that's, you know, you just give me four panels and uh, 
you could do, um, you know, comic books are a combination of words and images, right? Sometimes one, sometimes both. But try to use words and images to, to tell a story, okay? Okay, and then you have to complete the following phrases as best you can based on your predictions about the text and your thoughts and ideas after reading the text. So based on what I have just read, I now realize um, the evidence that supports my thinking is that so you have to use all five, right? So in, in that one, you have to use all five. Assignment eight is asking you to choose three prompts, okay? Um, and there's three different categories. So one of them is after reading, ask questions. What does the writer mean by? Why did, didn't? What have I learned? I wonder if. I've chosen one of them, so this is what I want you to do. So I wonder if I wonder if Jimmy goes back to back to jail or back to juvie or yeah. So I wonder, does he stay on the right path? Does he go right back to where he came from? Uh, or jail, right? Or jail. Or worse, does he go to jail? So I wonder, right? So when I restate it, I wonder if Jimmy is going to go, I, I, I wonder if Jimmy is going to go back to juvenile detention or end up in jail. Um, and then I can prove that by using examples from the text. So I can say, you know, I think he won't go back because he's got people in his life. Or I think he might go back because he's got some negative people in his life that might draw him back to his old ways, right? So I might make some connections with myself. I might tell some stories about people I knew in my life or other books I've read. I might give my opinion, um, and then I'll conclude it, wrap it up with a good ending, right? So I can use that rap rock method. So I have to pick one of these and write about it. Second category. What is, are the main ideas? So the most important thing I remember about this text is, the main message is, the text was mainly about this, right? I've chosen this one. The most important thing I remember about this text is, and I'm going to say, Jimmy's grandma, um, Offering him a meal. In this chapter, a lot of bad stuff happens to Jimmy. A lot of negativity is thrown his way. He's feeling negative. Things just don't look that great for Jimmy. But when he comes home, there's Grandma with the moose stew and the blueberries and all that, right? So she's giving him that comfort food. So that's the most important thing that I remember about the text, right? It may not be the most important thing to you, but that's what stuck out to me was Jimmy's grandma giving him that meal and trying to look after her grandson, right? So that's what I would do. So I would, uh, I would say the most important thing I remember about the text is Jimmy's grandma offering him a meal, you know. And then I might, I might, I might ant I might prove it by quoting the text, quoting the last page of the chapter where that happens. I think I think it's the last page. And then I would give my opinion on why, you know, why I think this, why I would tell you why it's important. I might make some connections to my own grandma and my own life, and then I conclude it and wrap it up, right? So that's how we answer that question. And then the third category is how do I put all the pieces together? There's your choices. You got to pick one of those, right? The one I chose is the message of this text is... And we can change the word text to chapter. And we could say the message of the chapter is, you know, it's to, it's to set up, let's say, Jimmy's, uh, his journey, right? 
I think the author of this novel, Robert Chekwitz, did a great job in this opening chapter. He set up Jimmy. Um, th there's a lot at stake for Jimmy, right? Every good book has a conflict, right? So the conflict here is, is Jimmy going to do the right thing? Is he going to get better? I is he going to go back to his dark ways? That's the tension here, right? It's like he's got a lot of people in his life that want to see him succeed and do well. But he's got a lot of negativity in his life. He's got a lot of stuff to deal with, right? He's got Teresa. He's got Gary. He's got all these conflicting things pulling him in different directions. What's he going to do? So I would argue that the main message is is to set up or, you know, to explain. To explain Jimmy's journey. And then I would explain how that happens. We'll come back to this tomorrow. We've only got about four minutes, but I'll set it up for today. We're, we're going to spend tomorrow's class talking about Assignment 9. And it, it asks you to do a journal entry. It's 15 marks. It's asking you to write three paragraphs, okay? So each paragraph should be at least five sentences in length. And I'm looking for about 250 to 300 words for this assignment. About 100 words a paragraph. Paragraph 1 asks you to describe how you can be an active participant. Paragraph 2 talks about how you can improve your literacy skills. And paragraph 3 is your willingness to reflect and learn from your mistakes. So, so we're talking about learning, okay? And it's really important for you to understand how you learn and to find ways that you can become a better, um, a better reader, a better writer. I was watching um, YouTube Shorts the other day and they and they talked about how like LeBron James and Serena Williams and like Beyonce and like all these superstars who are at the top of their game but they all have coaches and one of the main responsibilities of a coach of a teacher is to show the participant to show the student how they're doing things how they're progressing what kind of uh, active participant are there and to give them some strategies on how to get better. So, so you have to listen to the advice of the mentors in your life, but you have to do it yourself as well. You have to look at your own abilities and be critical of them and to find ways that you could be better. So maybe we'll just talk about step one. So if you're going to attack this problem, if you're going to complete assignment nine, I would suggest that you start by planning, step one, and you do some point form writing. So answer these questions. Are you an active participant in your own learning? Yes or no? Okay. In point form, why are you an active participant? Why are you not an active participant? Right? Paragraph two, how confident are you in terms of improving your literacy skills? One through ten. Write down that number. If it's a one, super low why is it one if it's a 10 why are you so confident right so why do you feel that way paragraph three how are you persistent what are your study practice habits how can you develop a willingness to reflect and learn from your mistakes in this course and that's a really important concept so a willingness to reflect and learn from your mistakes in this course and i would argue in your whole life right so you have to be willing to do that. You have to, you have to be willing. You have to embrace it. You have to say, okay. And when you reflect, you look back upon, and then you learn from your mistakes, right? So you say, well, I did it this way in the past. I'm going to do it better next time, okay? So, and if you feel you don't have those habits, if you feel you don't have good study habits, talk about that and just, and just talk about the negatives. Just say, like, these are the things that I do. These are the things that are holding me back. And just in point form, just say, like, you could even do, like, a, a good column and a bad column. Like, um, these are my good habits. These are my bad habits. My bad habits are watching YouTube videos and being unfocused and getting distracted, right? You know, that those are my bad habits and how can I do them? So, like, acknowledge what you're doing well. Acknowledge what you need to work on. 
do that in point form. And then tomorrow we'll come back and we'll make a, a better plan for attacking assignment nine. So thanks for tuning in today and we will join back tomorrow morning.